Now we can get to torsional shear stress. So what we talked about last time is that the shear strain increases linearly from the center. It goes all the way up to the max shear strain at the surface. And similarly, you can guess that our shear stress would also reach a maximum at the surface and would go to zero at our center line. Now, if we're in that elastic region, remember we have to be in that elastic region, then we can use Hooke's Law. And our shear stress and shear strain are simply connected through the mod, uh, uh, modulus of rigidity, our shear modulus. Now, we knew our max shear strain is at the surface, so our max shear stress is also at the surface. Also, to maintain equilibrium, any cross-sectional shear stress is always matched by a shear stress acting on a longitudinal surface, like so. So even though that this one right here is tangent to my surface, I would also have a shear stress going through my surface, I'm talking about the little surface element, that would be keeping each of these elements in equilibrium. Because it has to maintain equilibrium, otherwise a part of your little shaft is going to pop off and that's not, that just can't happen. So, how are we going to find the shear stress um, without just going straight from shear strain? It'd be nice if we could relate our torque to our shear stress. So to do this, we're going to look at a little tiny area dA. And I know you're like, oh no, not a derivation. But yes, it's got to be, we got to use a derivation here. It's going to be necessary. And so for this little tiny section dA, there is going to be some force that's going to be caused by the shear stress. So we know the shear stress is acting at that point, acting on dA, and that will give me some small, small element of the force. And we know that moment is equal to a force times a distance. So if I plug that in, I get that my moments, my infinitely small moment element from this little infinitely small area, is going to be equal to the radius at that point times the shear stress at that point, dA. But if we want to, we can rewrite this in terms of our max shear stress, because this is going to be a constant. And we get that the moment is going to be equal to the integral of rho squared dA. Now, to maintain equilibrium, this moment has to be equal to the torque T, because it's got to be blocking out. So the torque is going to be equal to all of this. And then finally, rather than calculate this ourselves, though sometimes you will have to, we can just replace it with a single variable called the polar moment of inertia, which is shown with a J. Now, this is given to you in your textbook for many shapes. You can look it up for others. So definitely try that first. Do not waste your time and pain and suffering trying to derive it for each individual shape. Just look it up. It's there for circles, for squares, for triangles. All the basic shapes you're going to see. Now using this we can then solve and get the torque in terms of the shear stress or the shear stress in terms of the torque. And this right here will be the shear stress at any particular position I care about inside of it. It's radially. Now the polar moment of inertia is a simple equation. You can look it up like I said to. Um, but for us, remember, we're only looking at solid circular shafts. So either it's going to be pi over 2 r to the fourth or pi over 32 diameter to the fourth. And if we have a hollow circular shaft, where d is the outside, the big d is the outside diameter and lowercase d is the inside diameter, we would get something like this. These are the two which would really help you if you memorize these, or at the least write them down somewhere that you'll be able to find them easily. I think that's everything. It is. So now we're going to try out an example or two to practice this and see how it goes. So thank you for listening, and I hope this helps you. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.